Okay. Okay. Uh, somebody told me that I forgot to say the ritual phrase. Hereby, I am opening uh, Tech Users Group 22 meeting. Okay, let's correct this. I, uh, I'm opening the meeting and I wish everybody very interesting time, uh, interesting discussions, and a lot of useful uh, thoughts, which is basically uh, what we are expecting of a meeting. Now, uh, I'm very happy to introduce our uh, first uh, speaker. Uh, Peter Williams. Uh, he wants uh, to be called Peter K. G. Williams because uh, there are so many Peter Williamses uh, in the world, uh, and uh, this would. Uh, uh, and uh, what I want to say is that it's very, I think, symbolical and uh, important that we are starting with this keynote. Uh, Peter Williams, uh, who got his PhD at uh, Berkeley and today is an innovation scientist of the Center for Anthrophysics at uh, Harvard, uh, put in his uh, web page uh, two important interests for him. It's uh, creation of tools for astronomers and astrophysicists to study uh, the universe and improving uh, the communication between uh, the scientists, uh, between the public and so on. His uh, important project, which is um, uh, uh, American Astronomical Society Worldwide Telescope, is not a physical teles telescope, but rather a, a suite of uh, open uh, and free software uh, tools to uh, join people uh, in their research. Uh, the reason why it's uh, close to us is because what we are doing is also creating tools for uh, other people to work on and, uh, imp uh, and uh, uh, improving uh, and setting up communication between uh, the people. So, I think that our uh, first speaker is very close to our aims and our world philosophy. And without further ado, let me uh, let me introduce to you Peter uh, K. G. Williams, our first speaker. Go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully, my audio is okay, and I'll start sharing my screen here. Um, hopefully you can see a title slide and uh, the way that my setup is, is unfortunately I won't be able to see the chat. Um, and so uh, if there's any important things, um, please, if one of the organizers could unmute and verbally tell me, that will probably be the best way. Uh, so I want to start off by saying that I'm really delighted and honored to be presenting here today. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, um, especially for accommodating. Uh, I have. I'm about to go off the internet for the entire weekend in an hour or two, um, so they worked hard to make it possible for me to present. Um, and also that means, unfortunately, I'm going to miss the rest of the conference, which I'm uh, sad about, um, but I'll try and catch up on it later. Um, but even besides all that, you know, I've been working on this project called Tectonic, which I'll tell you about today. Uh, it's largely been sort of outside of the main tech community. Um, I haven't traditionally joined these meetings. Um, or been involved in some of those main projects. And um, I'd love to start changing that because Tectonic is, you know, built on tech in a way that I'll explain. And, um, you know, I, I really want to make sure that, um, you know, it's one piece of this vibrant, very important community. Um, so I'm gonna start by uh, talking about my background myself. Um, and actually going to spend a relatively large amount of time on this because I think it's important for motivating the vision of this tectonic project. Uh, so I come to tech as a scientist, um, publisher, I feel like is not quite the right word, and a software developer. Um, so uh, I'm a research astronomer. My specialty is in radio interferometry and the magnetism of planets and small stars. Um, I can tell you all about that some other time. Uh, but my exposure to tech has been, you know, started out with writing scientific papers, um, you know, communicating my research work uh, amongst the scholarly community. 
My current position is I'm the innovation scientist of the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard Smithsonian. So I'm based at Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and also the American Astronomical Society, which is the National Society for American Astronomers. Um, and I have sort of a joint appointment between those two. Uh, at the AAS, I'm the director of this Worldwide Telescope project that uh, for the purpose of this talk, it's an interactive web application that we use to uh, share astronomical data. And uh, I'll get to the point of, I think, um, you know, that, that perspective infuses a lot of the way that I think about uh, the way that I want to communicate science. I also work with the AAS Publishing Group, uh, which publishes some of the major journals in astronomy and astrophysics. So Astrophysical Journal, AppJ, Astrophysical Journal Letters, AppJL. Uh, if you're in astronomy, you're, you're familiar with these. So we publish, I think, uh, AppJ is around 40,000 pages a year of um, astronomy research. And so uh, I, that's just what I mean when I say that I'm a publisher, where I'm, I've gotten more and more involved in the world of scholarly publishing and uh, how we communicate science, where you know it's really um, increased my depth of understanding for the complexity of the publishing ecosystem. I think a lot of our authors, you know, most of our authors submit manuscripts in tech. A lot of them think that the finished product uh, comes from tech. That's actually not true, uh, which is you know the sort of thing that I've learned more about the details of how we send it to a publisher in England who subcontracts to India, uh, etc. At the Center for Astrophysics, I work with a project called NASA ADS, uh, which is the Astrophysics Data System. Although, so really ADS is a database of the astronomical literature, uh, sort of like Google Scholar specialized to astronomy. I don't have time to go into here, but ADS is an amazing life change. Like it is really, really important. Um, the difference between something like Google Scholar that kind of works and something like ADS, which is incredibly polished and accurate um, uh, is life changing. Every time an astronomer uh, has to work in a field where they don't have ADS available, uh, they they appreciate that more and more. Um, and I just really, I just want to mention like how important ADS is if you're in the scholarly world as a, an example of the difference between sort of an acceptable tool and a really, really uh, high-end tool. Uh, you know, it's, it's superficially, it's the same thing, but in terms of how, how it enables you to work, it's hugely different. And I think uh, that is extremely relevant for tech in terms of how we communicate scientifically. Uh, I'm also a moderator uh, for the Astro PH category on archive.org. So I see a lot of uh, scientific manuscripts there. And I also want to point out that um, all of my experience with tech is very centered on LaTeX and Tech Live. Um, I don't really use other distributions. I'm not very familiar with context. Um, so that's just a piece of context uh, for how I come to things, which, you know, I try to uh, not be too parochial in my views, but um, in terms of what I work with, it's very centered on that. And finally, uh, I've been doing open source software development for more than 20 years, um, starting out with stuff in the GNOME project. Um, and one thing that I've learned, especially in my scientific work, is, you know, the, the quote unquote open source community has a lot of, uh, you know, practices and norms um, that you know, a lot of people who work with open source software don't necessarily, like researchers, don't necessarily know a lot of the things that are kind of standard in the open source world. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in that open source community um, that sometimes doesn't get tapped. And, you know, it's part of a difficulty of sharing that knowledge and just learning the norms and the tools that people use there. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been preoccupied with scholarly communication for a long time. Um, the way I think of it is there's this enormous gap between like what we could be doing to share research in the 21st century and how we actually do it. Um, and you can think of, you know, a gap is an opportunity for uh, improvement. Uh, in my view, that gap is almost entirely about the tools that people have available to create documents and share documents. And, you know, this is sort of the framework of the talk of, uh, you know, we have an opportunity for better tools. Um, in particular, the thing that I think is just the most important uh, is what I call a 21st century document. That's not necessarily great terminology, uh, but thinking of documents designed for digital displays. Uh, you know, the screen of a computer in a certain sense is a strictly more powerful medium than a printed page. Uh, it's interactive, it can change. Um, and 21st century documents, I think, are primarily defined by being digital native and having this capacity for interaction. 
And I'm just really, really fascinated with how we can communicate more effectively by taking advantage of that. Um, and I think, you know, that's not to say that the printed page is, is worthless. Um, you know, we should, you know, there's always a place for books and there are things that they can do better that the, that the screen cannot. Um, and I think it's very important to understand, you know, when, uh, which time, which kind of medium is better for which needs. Uh, but me personally, as a working scientist, I hardly ever print anything out. Almost everything I read is on the screen. Um, and things that are designed to be printed on the page that are I'm viewing on the screen, uh, you know, that's not going to be an optimal way of communicating something. I might be riding the bus home trying to read the latest postings on archive and reading one of those PDFs on a mobile phone is really annoying. Um, I want us to be in a world where we can build documents that are designed for that form factor. And I want to make a point that specifically uh, documents like this are HTML. Um, you know, the way I think of it is, you know, the web browser is is basically the modern system for interactive interfaces, applications, multimedia, everything. You know, the industry is spending literally billions of dollars a year building this tool uh, for, you know, you can do VR in the web browser. You can do astronomy data visualization. You can do computation in Jupyter. Um, the web browser is how we create documents uh, right now. Now, the stack of web standards, as many of us know, is complicated and messy and gross. Um, but, you know, HTML is, I would say, the overriding, you know, that's the format that we have to target, whether we like it or not. Um, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Again, this is, uh, this is, you know, unless you have your own billions of dollars to spend, uh, the web browser is always going to be adding new capabilities and there will always be opportunities for other formats, but I think there will be fewer and fewer things that the web browser can't do well, to put it that way. Um, and so, for instance, you might notice that I'm not creating my slides in Beamer. I use HTML for my presentations. And one reason is that I can do things like interactivity in my slides. Uh, so here's something that I've just cloned from my research. Of this is a graph of essentially um, mathematical models where I think you should be able to see my cursor of synchrotron radiation that you get from uh, energetic particles and magnetic fields in space. And these lines up top are some data that we have. And this is just a demonstration of there's different parameters in this simple model, and I can adjust the parameters. And for instance, this L parameter basically makes the curve go up and down overall. The B parameter shifts the location of the peak. Uh, the NE parameter, which is a density of electrons, also does that, but in a different way where the left-hand side doesn't change. And this delta parameter adjusts the slope of the peak. Um, and, you know, I could have shown an equation that essentially captures all this, but in my opinion, being able to see an interactive adjustment like that uh, is much more effective um, than writing down the equation, for most people at least. Um, and this is, you know, this is the thing where you know, I would not do my presentations any other way now because the web is this, you know, the web browser is by far the most effective way that I'm going to be able to create something like this. And this is done using a framework called reveal.js, uh, which allows me, you know, I can even have a presenter view, I can make a printable version, uh, you know, it's essentially full featured presentation software and I could do stuff like this that would absolutely not be possible in PowerPoint or, you know, viewing a PDF. Um, for technical documents, the limiting factor for a long time was you couldn't do what I'll call precision tech typography of, you know, the layout of, of this kind of stuff that tech does with mathematics. Um, and I've got a screenshot here of classic LaTeX to HTML, which, you know, there's a broken embedded image and the, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the typography is, is not great, I would say. Um, and if you're talking about, so what I call a technical document of something like a research report or a scientific paper, you know, it's usually something long, dense cross-referencing -refer equations, figures. Uh, nowadays, we can have computation. Um, I would say, and I think if you're tuning into this presentation, you would probably also agree that being able to do precise type typography for math is super important. And if you can't do that in HTML, um, then, then it's not really the format that you want to output that you want to target for technical documents. Um, the thing that really changed this in my mind was the release of PDF.js. So this is in 2011, more than 10 years ago at this point, 
which is a JavaScript package that can view PDFs. Um, and so, you know, if you can render a PDF in JavaScript in a web browser, that means that the web browser is capable of doing what you need to get that kind of precision typography. Uh, and so in particular, you know, I don't know how it works now, but PDF.js includes JavaScript code that's essentially font renderers and, and you know, every little bit that you need to do this stuff correctly. Um, and, you know, if you can do all that in JavaScript, that means that it is possible to target that HTML format, which then gives you the ability to do things like create documents that have mobile renditions that work really well and, and target this platform, which is essentially the universal platform uh, for digital documents in the 21st century. So I started uh, saying, I wonder, okay, now that this is, you know, exists, like, can we actually do that precise typography? You know, classic LaTeX, LaTeX to HTML uses images, and I want to see, like, can we actually do that typography as text? Um, so my first strategy was like, okay, this will be fun to like implement, just sort of, let's see if we can do tech in JavaScript. You know, tech the program is 500 pages. Like that's, you know, how hard can it be? Uh, the answer is pretty hard. Um, I, I got decently far, but as I basically learned more and more about how tech actually works, um, had less and less superficial understanding of the system, I realized like how much, you know, a cleaner implementation would just be an amazingly huge effort. Um, so I gave up on this pretty quickly, uh, but it really was informative for me and underscored for me how much value there is in the tech ecosystem. And I mean that in a narrow sense, uh, in the sense that, you know, tech.web is just the tip of an iceberg of a whole lot of software and tools that work together. Um, and in a broader sense of, you know, there are people who say, you know, we don't need tech, we'll just use Markdown for everything. Um, and I think, again, if you're tuning into this, you probably disagree with that. Um, and I think, you know, there is an immense value in what tech can do. And I think it's really, really important to make sure that we preserve that value going forward so that, you know, if people say, oh, I'd rather use Markdown, we can have a compelling response to say, you know, this is going to be better. Um, and for me, you know, there's a lot uh, that's really important. Like there's just this huge human achievement uh, that many of the people on this call have contributed to a really like important artifact of human civilization. Um, and I think, you know, we want to we want to make sure that artifact doesn't just become a thing of the past, but remains living and vibrant. Um, so after giving up on the sort of clean room approach, I was like, okay, maybe I, you know, I'll see if I can just hack tech itself uh, and um, develop my own, you know, just play around and see what I can build on. Now, at this point, um, I, you know, had learned a little bit more and saw that, okay, ZTech is Unicode capable. It has support for true type and open type fonts. So that was the platform that I chose to build on. Um, to be honest, I wasn't aware of Lua Tech um, and uh, sort of some of the other options that were out there. Uh, so that was what I went with. And I think um, I'm happy with, with building on that, but it's not like there is a super profound reason for choosing that. That was just what I had become familiar with. So I'll be honest. Um, I wanted to, you know, play around with the code a little bit. And uh, the experience for that in the existing system is really rough. Uh, just yesterday, I was trying to sort of check in on this and see how things were and compare different systems. And, you know, I was looking for sort of the original source repository for Lua Tech as a comparison example. And it took me like 15 minutes to find it. Um, and then I realized a little bit later that I'd actually not found the correct thing and there was a different repository to go to. Um, you know, stuff like this basically is, is unfriendly if you're a person who's looking to get involved in the source code. And that is what I was looking to do. And I basically concluded I could not work with tech and play around with the code in the way that I wanted in this sort of framework that exists right now. I do not want to do my development without using Git and GitHub and pull requests and CI systems. And there's a lot of great tools out there, um, which as far as I can tell, have really not been adopted in the tech world. Um, and, you know, I could see why this is the case for a variety of reasons. Um, and, you know, some of those reasons, you know, some of them are not good or bad. They're just historical contingency. Uh, but in my opinion, I'll put it this way. I think there are real opportunities um, that a different approach that sort of use some more standard tools and putting an effort to modernize some of these uh, development processes could really capture. Um, 
all I can say is, you know, there's a reason that I use Git instead of Subversion. In my opinion, like Git is much, much better uh, in the same way that ADS is better than Google Scholar, in the same way that tech is better than Markdown for some for a lot of purposes. Uh, you know, there's a reason that GitHub has however many bajillion users it has. Um, it's really a good system. So, uh, you know, I still wanted to pursue this project. And so, you know, if I was like, okay, if I really need to, you know, think it's worthwhile to adopt my own tools, that's kind of a big decision. Because, uh, you know, if, if you take that sort of different infrastructure and start using some of the more standard open source processes, there's no realistic prospect for merging that work back into the main line. Uh, you know, if you really adopt those systems, um, especially continuous integration, where I could talk to you for an hour about the beauty of modern continuous integration systems, um, you can't uh, you you can't bring it back. And so, really, that becomes you know you're not just creating a branch and experimenting and merging the work back in, but you're forking the software project, uh, which is a really you know that's a that's a big decision, um, but it can also be liberating in the sense of okay, if we're really gonna aim to be our own thing, then, you know, we can decide to, uh, you know, we can decide what we want to keep and what we don't feel like we need to keep. Um, and so at the same time, you know, there's work that I would not want to do because it should stay in the main line. You know, if you're going to incrementally improve something that is fully, you know, a part of just a part of the existing system, you don't want to go down the road of doing that in a way where you're not going to be able to contribute back. So it also kind of gives you some clarity of focusing on let's focus on the things that really are very different, not just, you know, not just improving. Um, so for instance, uh, hopefully people can agree that the user experience of tech can often be a little frustrating. Uh, so this is a Google result of about six and a half million Google hits for LaTeX error driving me crazy. Um, but many of these things, you know, the thing that I hear most commonly is people complaining about text error messages and due to how the system works, like you, you can't change those and still call that thing tech in the traditional sense. Um, and so, you know, if we're saying, okay, if we're going to move to div different development infrastructure and do things separately, then this also offers us an opportunity to do things a little bit differently in that way. And so I think, you know, as I sort of came to think about these different pieces of things, you sort of see uh, a hole in the system where I think if we're going to build a new effort that is based on kind of different development uh, approaches and, you know, if it's going to be separate, then we can think about adjusting the user experience. And if we're going to be targeting uh, digital documents in a new way, you know, this is sort of starting to feel like a thing uh, that has these different uh, shapes to it. And for lack of a better term, once again, I, I'll call this kind of 21st century tech, um, even though I feel like that's a little bit limiting of a term, uh, but that's that's the shorthand that I have for this kind of idea of, you know, let's let's try some different things and see how it works. And so, of course, uh, that hole uh, is filled by the Tectonic Project, in my mind. Um, and so uh, it was launched in 2016. And I guess I'd like to frame it in terms of some broad visions of what I would like the world to be like. You know, I'd like, it to, I'd like us to have a world where people can easily create digital tech technical documents that are both beautiful and excellent. And by excellent, I mostly mean, you know, well-designed in a sense where they the reader, you know, they serve the reader uh, effectively. Um, we're creating these documents is something that's reliable and ideally bit for bit reproducible. Uh, where tech or the, you know, the tech language, uh, the tech experience can go anywhere in the sense that, you know, I can, if I'm creating a blog post or creating a large technical manual or writing a comment on some kind of forum that the power of the things that tech makes possible is possible in all of those places. Um, and that using and learning tech is, is fun and even delightful. Um, you know, I think of it as something like learning a version control tool like Git. It's sort of to me like learning calculus if you're sort of of that age where you know, you're like, hey, how do I find the maximum of this function? And you do some stuff and you kind of you know, you do things in an ad hoc fashion. And then when you learn, oh, there's a whole system that helps us do this 
in a you know reliable way you know i've unlocked the underlying truth uh beneath this and then oh if i understand the system then i can do things i didn't even know were possible before um you know that's a wonderful feeling and i think that's the kind of feeling that i want tech to unlock in people um it'd also be nice for tectonic to have a nice logo uh, that's something that we haven't developed yet it would be in the corner here if we had one um, and all of these things, you know, I think if you love tech of any form, uh, you probably want to see all these things happen. But I think the fundamental idea is that I think with the permission to really try new things and break some existing things uh, that Tectonic gives itself, uh, I think that will allow us to explore the vision of where this, what the world could be like um, in a different way than has been possible. And so to put it in sort of like corporate terms, that's like a distinctive brand identity um, is, you know, it is in many ways, it's the same thing, but we call it a different thing. And that gives us, you know, we can try and build a different picture in people's minds about what it is. And also we can just, you know, we can say, okay, we don't have to worry about this particular thing. Um, for instance, you know, if you Google uh, help for various LaTeX matters, often, there's okay here's the 18 different ways you could do it depending on which exact kind of uh you know package and engine and setup you're using and i think you know being able to have a more focused vision of you know here's the one recommended tectonic way uh really makes a lot of things easier when it comes to building an idea in people's minds of of what they're doing and just helping them um so you know i kind of hate to talk in this sort of you know marketing kind of attitude but frankly i think it is I think it is an important idea of what Tectonic is, is, is it's a brand. Uh, so getting to the specifics, um, Tectonic is delivered as a self-contained executable. So our releases on GitHub are tar files that just have uh, one executable in it. Uh, so it's bundling uh, what I call the engines of ZTech, BibTech, and XDV, XDVI PDF MX. So uh, the most important thing is how do we do ZTech? So we basically, back in the day, I took the C code generated by the Web2C processing um, and just inserted it manually and have been refactoring it to do things like restore symbolic constants and make the layout more uniform. And you know, the idea is to be hue as close as possible to that original source, um, but make it more maintainable. And so the link here is to the GitHub repository, which has all the tools um, to do that kind of generation. So when there's a new tech live release, uh, I rerun these tools and generate a giant diff of the source code and manually import all those updates and review them. And obviously, you know, this is the price of, of the fork is that um, it's done this way, it's going to be eat error prone. I'm sure that I've introduced mistakes in this process. Um, uh, so I don't love that this is the case, um, but I think it's necessary to have this system that can kind of stand on its own, be the self-contained system. And sometimes people have people will have the idea that Tectonic is just sort of another wrapper around other engines. And I think it's very important to establish that it is its own thing. Uh, so besides the engines, Tectonic is written in the Rust language. And this is my favorite part of any of these talks because you get to be visited by the Rust Evangelism Strike Force, and I am absolutely a member of it. Um, so Rust is a systems language. Uh, you would use it in places where you would use C or C++. And I don't have time to pursue this argument here, uh, but I believe as much of a profound achievement that tech is, Rust is as well. Um, like I believe that it is transformative for how we think about the kind of computing that we do. Like I never thought that there'd be a language that would supplant C in terms of writing that kind of code. Um, but I never want to write C again if I can avoid it. Uh, Rust is just that much better. And again, I could talk to you for an hour about why I feel that way. I won't have time to do that. Um, but it really opens your minds about what software can be like. And um, yeah, it, again, it, all I can say is that I never want to write C again if I can avoid it. Um, in particular, Rust has a packaging and compilation model that's a great fit for Tectonic. Uh, so it's one of these languages where most of your dependencies are pulled in. You can say, I depend on this HTTP library or this cryptography library. And it's pulled in and compiled and you get an executable that includes all that code statically. 
and you don't have dependencies on external shared libraries. Um, so the cost is that you have big executables, um, but you know, memory is cheap these days. And the benefit is that, you know, for instance, for some of the stuff I'll talk about, I can include an HTTP library and, you know, it just works. I don't have to worry about the dependency interfacing with the rest of the system. It's high quality. You know, Rust is an immensely popular language these days. It's been the most loved language on Stack Overflow for five years running or something like that. There's libraries for everything. So if I want to add font parsing or web stuff or image parsing, I can just bring in the libraries, no problem. Um, and uh, it all compiles down to a single executable. The optimizer can do some really clever stuff. I can integrate the C code that underlies the engines. Um, and I can define really nice interfaces so that you don't have to use Tectonic as a binary. You can actually include it as a library. Uh, I haven't tried this. It should compile to WebAssembly just fine uh, with pretty minimal changes. Um, it's just a really great fit for exactly the kind of code uh, that something like Tectonic wants to be. Um, also, I'd say that Rust and Tectonic are similar languages in spirit. I mean, they both have a reputation for being challenging but empowering. Um, uh, Rust definitely, the way that is able to do some of the great things that it does is it adds some new concepts about managing mutability and data ownership, um, which are very hard to wrap your mind around at first. Um, but you can see how they help you write better software. And, um, and I think that Tectonic aims to bring a lot of the Rust ethos uh, to tech. And you know, I think Rust has been successful with this difficult language for a variety of reasons. Um, so they, one of the most important ones is they have this ecosystem orientation where it's not just a language implementation, it's a package manager, it's a document system, it's a testing framework, it's language servers and programs like VS Code to help you, um, uh, to help you man manage, edit your code. Um, and all those tools are best in class. They're really phenomenal. Um, they really try hard to have a welcoming atmosphere. Their attitude is sort of like, you know, it's hard, but you can do it. Um, or, you know, there's a learning curve, but we try really hard to make it, uh, you know, help people up. Um, and they're very welcoming, you know, they, they strive to be welcoming for contributing to, you know, documentation, development. Uh, they, they view sort of that getting people to learn, get over that learning curve, get over the hump, get into it as a really important aspect of the project overall. Part of that is a lot of what they design is centered around making a really smooth experience. Uh, for instance, uh, the error messages uh, so here's an example of an error message for the compiler where, um, you know, just imagine writing the code needed to render this ASCII output of identifying the line of source code and interleaving these little labels and help and all this stuff. And uh, the Rust compiler is, is famous for um, people say it's like, you know, your genius friend who helps you work through the problems that you run into. Um, and yeah, there, you know, there's an immense amount of effort going into this kind of experience. And I think that's an important aspect of thinking about experience design is sometimes it's, you know, how do we frame this text better to make more sense to people? But sometimes it's like building whole new engineering efforts to, to make things more friendly to people. Um, a major aspect of what Tectonic does is uh, it fetches files from bundles on the fly. Uh, so underneath the sort of standard tech IO interfaces, there's a virtualized system where um, if a request comes in for a particular file, if it's in the local tree, it will use that. If not, it will go to this bundle. Um, and so it's designed to, it can hit the network, but it won't do it if you're rebuilding a document and no new file is needed. So, you know, you should be able to compile your document on an airplane or whatever. Uh, so the bundle is essentially a big tar file um, identified as a hash of its contents. It's kind of in a one layer Merkle tree. Um, here's a link to the repository that generates those bundles. And so the key thing though, is besides being convenient and sort of being able to do this on the fly file fetching, this is really a cornerstone of an approach to making document builds reproducible, uh, where a standard document, if you sort of associate it with a single bundle, hopefully, uh, you know, that should be the thing that you build against. You should get the same output if someone else builds it against the same bundle. Um, and as you might be able to read from the text here, you can sort of get a sense of there's some versioning and updates. So when a new release comes out, you might update the bundle, but existing documents, if they specify the older bundle, they'll still build against the older bundle. Um, 
And so uh, this is, you know, it's essentially technology wise, it's very simple, but this is the kind of thing where like, I would not want to implement this HTTP zip indexing stack in PRC. You know, you either have to pull in a bunch of dependencies, which make your distribution a lot harder, or you have to write a bunch of code from scratch. Uh, but with Rust, I can get all that stuff close to being for free. Uh, there's also a, a document model that I've started introducing uh, for describing builds, and this is extremely cribbed from the way that Rust packaging uh, program Cargo does things. So in a sort of minimal document, it's identified by this tectonic.toml file, where toml is, uh, you, you can see it on the right here, it's sort of a you know, structured data format, which is uh, used by Rust a lot, and it's convenient, it's pretty lightweight. Um, and then it by default has a source tree where it creates for you a preamble, postamble, and index uh, tech files, where this is kind of in response to what I see scientists doing, where everyone's tech file just accumulates this sort of like 300 initial lines of boilerplate that they copy from one manuscript to the other. And that always really bothers me. Um, and so I want to sort of, you know, hint to people that, you know, we can put all that stuff in one file and then our main document file can actually just have the document te uh, text. So the key thing about this is I want to express all the sort of gnarly build settings and options in a static configuration file instead of adding a proliferation of command line options to the tectonic binary. Um, now you want to make as much of that stuff, you know, serializable, saved. And so the idea is then I can just run tectonic build in a directory of one of these files and the right thing will happen no matter what. Um, it's a really nice uh, format, you know, way to be able to work. Um, should also mention, uh, so you could, there's a tectonic-x compile command for sort of a traditional, I want to compile this file without worrying about any of this stuff that will always be available. Um, and the dash X flag is sort of a migration helper. The original uh, command line interface was more like classic tech. I want to migrate to um, what I call a multi-tool sort of style like subversion or Git, where you have these sub commands. Uh, so maybe hopefully eventually one day the X will go away. You can just say tectonic build or tectonic compile my file dot tech. And right now this framework is pretty sparse, um, but I think it's a platform for building a lot of functionality uh, that will be cool. So I'm running short on time. So I do want to show something very important. So uh, since the beginning, I've always said that I really want to get HTML output. Uh, that hasn't happened for uh, up until this year. And so, as I mentioned before, I feel like the kind of crux of the thing is, can we deliver precise typography? Um, so the way I approach this is, you know, if you can use a font that's compatible, you know, browser and open type font, CSS can let you position characters at will. Um, so, you know, definitely that part of things is possible. The, the key challenge that I ran into is that if I take the output from ZTech, you get glyphs of, you know, use this particular glyph from this particular font in this particular location. Um, and, you know, the browser doesn't let you specify glyphs in any way that I'm aware of. Uh, so I devised the solution to this, which I think might be novel, of um, we essentially do fake subsetting of fonts where, uh, say, for instance, I'm running an equation and there's an integral sign. Uh, the fonts table says Unicode character for integral maps to this glyph, which is sort of the default size, but I might need a larger integral glyph. And there's no specific Unicode character that maps to that glyph. Uh, so what we do is we emit a copy of the font, which is um, nominally subsetted, where we've basically used the same glyph data, but rewritten the Unicode mapping uh, to say, okay, the Unicode character for integral sign maps to the big integral sign uh, just by synthesizing that table. Um, it's a little gross, uh, but it allows us to essentially say, if ZTEC says you need to put this glyph here, it gives us a mechanism to make sure the browser renders that glyph. Um, and then this precise positioning only happens in what we call a canvas, which is say an inline math equation or a display equation, or you know the word tech prettily type set. And then other stuff is um, is just rendered as HTML text. And then the sort of default way that I approach this um, is to not try and work on generic inputs, 
but to work in very specific cases and hopefully we'll make it work more broadly. Um, so the Chrome is sort of what I call all this stuff around the document and the interface, which is most of the effort. Um, and, you know, really once you get the HTML stream, most of the interesting problems I think are in designing this Chrome. Uh, so I'm going to skip that. I think there's basically one good way to do this, and I've been prototyping it with ZTech the program, which is like a perfect test case for one of these technical documents. It's long, it's got rich internal structure, and it's useful to me. Um, I have a program called TT Weave, which is working on generating this output. So uh, I did something a little ridiculous, and I wrote a web parser that converts it to a prettified uh, Rust syntax or C slash Rust syntax because to be honest, I find the traditional weave PDF output very hard to read. Um, and we're keeping limited. So, OK, I want to show you this. Um, so this is the output of tech the program from this program. So it's using the sort of centered main column format. Uh, you can see there's some syntax highlighting of the color. So this is the entire Z tech the program as one giant screen. So you know, if you paginated it, it's something like several thousand pages, um, but it works as one giant web page just fine. Um, and in terms of the interface, I think the key thing is, you know, there's very little of this Chrome, you're not seeing a table of contents, but I can do things like press the C key and pop up the contents and go to token lists. And then I can maybe scroll around. Now, if I see a cross reference to a section, I can click on that and that can give me information about the section where it's defined, where it's referenced. Um, and so like if I know what section I want to go to, I can press a G key and go to section, you know, three, four, five, like this, and it will take me to that section. Um, and so you can see if you look closely, you know, I find, I think the typography is pretty good. If I go up to the top, you know, tech, tech looks right. It's selectable text. Um, there's plenty of room for improvement. Uh, but I think the main thing is, you know, at this point, you know, there's going to be issues, but the stuff that I think is much more interesting is, you know, how do we build the interface for this document? Because really, you know, this document is a text heavy web application. Um, and I think there's just a ton of really interesting questions about how do we design these? You know, how do I deal with figures, uh, mobile friendly, mobile friendliness, accessibility? Um, and I think most of those questions are actually kind of in the HTML Chrome space and not in the text space. Once you have the capability, you know, there will always be problems to solve, especially if you want to say, I want as many times of tech documents to look good as I can manage. Um, but I think, you know, the stuff that fascinates me is, uh, is what's going on on that kind of Chrome web app side. Uh, this is something, so for instance, people have this idea called scrolly telling, which like, you know, personally, as you, I'm scrolling down, as you scroll down, you get these different uh, things showing up. Personally, I don't know if I love scrolly telling, but this is kind of interaction that people are experimenting with. And it'd be cool to be able to experiment it with kind of tech technical documents and not just things that are sort of one off web applications. Um, after this, uh, Tectonics documentation is admittedly poor. I find it very uh, scary to think about trying to write good documentation because I think like Donald Knuth back in the day, you probably need to write several books uh, to really capture it well. For interest of time, I'm going to skip that. Um, I do want to say, so I'm getting to the point where, you know, there's so much that I don't know about that I'm kind of making up as I go along. And, you know, that's the thing that you have to do to create something. But um, there's a lot of places where the expertise of people in the tech community uh, would really make a huge difference for not going down some really dumb paths um, and just being able to do well for all sorts of things that I personally do not know about. Um, and this is the thing where I think we've reached the point where if any of this is kind of interesting to you about how to approach this all, um, you know, I want to have that sort of welcoming vibe of, of you know, contributions, people's insights and different perspectives are going to be more and more important. Um, to be honest, you know, most of this has been me centric. I've definitely been the person driving the project, uh, but that, you know, the more that can change, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I want to thank you for my attention. And I really want to, you know, explicitly offer my gratitude because, you know, what I've shown you, what I've been doing would not be possible uh, without, you know, many, many people who have done, you know, amazing, incredible work for decades. Uh, 
you know, especially people like Jonathan Q, Khalid Hosni, Donald Knuth, of course, um, everyone involved in the TUG, Tech Live, ZTech, XDVI, PDF, MX. You know, th again, there's this whole iceberg, and you know, I'm building on top of it, and I really want to try and make sure that I'm crediting all that work uh, in what I do. Uh, so here are a few links, and I will stop there. Peter, would you have a, a little bit of time for uh, one or two questions? Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry for not leaving more time. I can stay for maybe, I don't want to run into the next talk, but um, as long as you are comfortable, um, I can go. Yes, um, I mean, the first one is, how do you see the preservation of the content generated by Tectonic, you know, 50 years down the line or something like that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. And um, in my work on sort of double AS publishing journal side, we we see a similar kind of question of, um, you know, we're interested in those journals in creating interactive web applications and, and allowing people to sort of explore this kind of thing. But preservation, you know, essentially, as you get more sophisticated in this kind of thing, preservation becomes harder. Uh, so I think of defense in depth as kind of um, as an example from the journals, if we have an interactive figure, we also require a static version of the figure and we feel more comfortable with the static ver version. If the interactive version breaks, you know, the static version is more likely to live a long time. Uh, for here, I think the reproducibility of builds is really important of, um, you know, if we can build things reliably and, and, you know, using the bundle system record exactly what sort of reference point it was built against. Hopefully that at least means that the source is still usable. If you are using that source to build a web application that plugs into all sorts of network services, um, you know, that becomes a danger for for preservation. And, um, you know, it's uh, apparently there's some kind of air raid siren going off. I hope that isn't too distracting. Um, and so, uh, I think it's really, you know, all you can do is, you know, these things are valuable. Plugging in these network services is valuable, but they also make things more fragile. And, um, you know, I think we ideally will have systems that let us degrade gracefully uh, if those network systems uh, stop being available or have other issues. The other question we have is, um, I think you addressed it on the, on the uh, uh, second to last uh, slide, which is about Unicode to glyph mapping for uh, complex scripts like Indic, Arabic, and so forth, where you, you, you sort of uh, take, uh, you know, different characters, different code points and combine them in order to make different glyphs, combine them in different ways to make different glyphs. But I guess you did mention on your last slide that uh, this is a work to, to still happen. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a, a perfect example of the kind of thing where I honestly don't know what I'm doing. So the vision is that um, essentially we go from the, we try to reverse map from the glyphs that we get out of the engine to Unicode code points that we can then insert in into an HTML document, um, you know, for English text that is often straightforward. I don't know about other scripts. Uh, the overall hope is that, you know, Tectonic on the inside or ZTech is running HarfBuzz for doing that work. Uh, the browsers, I believe almost all are as well. And so the hope is that, you know, there is this kind of magic phase where you hope that the browser will make the same choices that the engine made. Um, and I don't know if there are, like, again, people probably know if there are times when that kind of reverse mapping is not possible. Um, that would be sort of the scary thing where the approach there would then be, you'd have to instrument the engine to include some specials to give some hints uh, to the thing that kind of reverses back into Unicode. Um, so I hope that it will be a tractable problem, but this is exactly the kind of thing where, um, you know, I know that my Latin centricity probably gives you some blind spots about how to implement it. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, beautiful talk. Um, I guess we're going to have lots to learn about the atomic in the near future. 
Thanks. And um, yeah, I, I'm, my apologies for not being able to leave more time for questions and for not being available for the rest of the weekend. But um, my contact information is here. And uh, yeah, I'm just really delighted to be able to share this and hopefully, you know, spark some inspiration. And um, with that, I'm going to have to sign off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.